I'm Pamela Everhart, Head of Regional Public Affairs and Community Relations at Fidelity Investments. Fidelity is honored to once again support the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference. And we thank Congressional Black Caucus Chair Joyce Beatty, House Financial Services Committee Chairwoman Maxine Waters, and Congressional Black Caucus Foundation President and CEO Tanya Beasy for their tireless work to address issues of racial inequality and social injustice. The disproportionate systematic effects of inequality on communities of color were further exacerbated by COVID-19, placing even greater stress on nonprofit organizations working to meet these communities' needs. In this moment, companies should take a pause, look at community impact and ask, can we be doing more? How can we be more inclusive in the communities where we live and work? This is the very assessment Fidelity undertook after the onset of the pandemic, which included a virtual listening tour that connected us with over 60 nonprofit organizations across the country. We used our learnings to more methodically target our support to those nonprofits focused on serving black and brown communities. For example, Fidelity partnered with national organizations, including those serving communities of color to support 200 food banks and 60,000 food pantries and meal programs across the country, focused on meeting the needs of the population. Fidelity directed grants and other necessary technology equipment to schools and nonprofit partners, including Boys and Girls Clubs. These efforts boosted connectivity and engagement for students and teachers, especially black and brown students who were hardest hit by the lack of access to technology in schools. Through Common Impact, the nationally recognized nonprofit, Fidelity Associates donated hundreds of hours on critical business projects to nonprofits focused on social justice and racial equity. Fidelity also believes that everyone should know how finances fit into their life. But systemic racism has denied equal access to financial tools. Toward this end, Fidelity is targeting its delivery of financial education programs and experiences to black and brown communities to support wealth creation and saving for retirement. We're also building the capacity of nonprofits focused on removing barriers to a financial education by increasing access to financial tools for children, teachers, and parents. Through organizations like Becoming a Man, Black Girls Code, and Teach for America, and we're working with public and private partners, including HBCUs and HSIs. We're committed to diversifying the financial services industry and building a more robust talent pipeline. Closing the racial wealth gap is a priority for Fidelity and it's personal to me. And we look forward to working with you, many other policymakers, educators, community leaders and organizations like the CBC Foundation to rise to the challenge. We hope you will join us. Thank you and enjoy the conference. Good morning. What an incredible opportunity it is again to be here with the most magnificent member of Congress. I said it. <laughs> The Reverend Dr. Professor, and I mean every bit of that, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, 
a remarkable instigator of good, a remarkable legislator for the betterment of our society, an incredible cog in the machinery of American democracy, and a leading light and a powerful voice to recognize the fundamental prospects of democracy for all peoples, but in this case, especially for African-American people, for black folk who are perennially stuck at the bottom of the boat, so to speak, and for those who face an enormous wealth gap. This brain trust every year continues to confront the gaping abyss, the yawning chasm between the have gots and the have nots, and this is not simply about uh, income. This is about wealth. Income is what you get at the job, the money you're able to generate. Wealth is about a self-perpetuating possibility of accumulated uh, capital that allows you to leverage it in defense of your family and in the pursuit of the best possible version of an American dream, not an unyielding pursuit of capital, not an unquenchable thirst uh, for money, but something more deeply rooted in the American scene that African people in America have taught us. And that is about building up spiritual and moral and also, yes, therefore financial uh, possibilities and wealth. And the wealth gap is huge. The yawning abyss between those in the dominant aspect of American society, those white brothers and sisters who've been able by virtue of inheritance, right? Not simply by making money because they were more worthy or more determined uh, to reap a financial benefit, but because they inherited such enormous possibilities uh, over the centuries in ways that were systemically denied to black people. So that yawning abyss, that growing chasm between the have-gots and the have-nots, the wealth between Black America and white and other America is enormous. That's why every year it is a tremendous opportunity for this particular panel, for this particular drain trust of this remarkable woman who now heads the Congressional Black Caucus. It's visionary, it's luminary, it's powerful, penetrating, insightful thinker, and of course, leader, has given us again, the possibility of discussing deeply rooted issues that are entrenched in American culture that continue to tell on the, the, the gaping hole between uh, those of us who are black and those of us who have inherited wealth from the very beginning. What do we do? What policies must be put in place? What serious systemic thinking must be put forth in order for us to dislodge what is appears to be an immovable object that continues to prevent the flourishing of black people in America? Economics is important. Why? Martin Luther King Jr. said, look, it was easy when we got the Voting Rights Act. It was easy when we got the Civil Rights Bill. It's gonna be far more difficult to have the third level, the third leg of that tripod, which is economic justice. He said, this will cost the nation something. This is why systemically and systematically, the preventing of black accumulation of wealth through the denial of reparations, through the denial of affirmative action more completely realized, through the denial of jobs that pay us a living wage, through the denial of access to funds and resources that allow us to accumulate wealth and blocking us systemically from enjoying uh, the financial benefits of our enormous intelligence, of our incredible talent, and of our unstinting labor. That's why Congresswoman Joyce Beatty's brain trust is always a hot spot, a place to be, a remarkable panel of, as you will see today, intelligent, insightful, powerful, creative thinkers. And so I'm honored to give these few marks of introduction to this incredible panel, uh, the Reverend Dr. Professor Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, one of my favorite human beings on earth, a remarkable woman who has given us insight, vision, and courage, will now continue to apply her craft and to deliver to you some of the most powerful insights about wealth, the disparity of wealth, the inability for us to create opportunities heretofore that have overcome that barrier, but the creative thinking of intelligent human beings that will allow us to create greater opportunities for the vast numbers of our people. 
I turn it over now to the great Congresswoman from the state of Ohio, Joyce Beatty. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Michael Eric Dyson, for opening today's forum. Money, wealth, disparities, build black better, narrowing the wealth gap. I want to note that Dr. Dyson has moderated or presented on our Money and Wealth and Disparity series since its inception, almost a decade ago. And I am so grateful for his commitment to the annual legislative conference, the Congressional Black Caucus, and to me as a dear friend. Michael, congratulations on your new role at Vanderbilt. Centennial Chair of the University Distinguished Professor of African American and Diaspora Studies in the College of Arts and Science, as well as University Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Society in the Divinity School. Michael, why are we not surprised that you have added this to being a scholar, an author, and a prolific speaker? Well, Michael, I get to do your job as being the moderator today, but thank you for joining us. To each of our very distinguished panelists, I am honored to share the virtual stage with you for what I know will be the best panel of this conference. After a few opening remarks, we'll start our dialogue. Each year, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's annual legislative conference brings together federal, state, local, policymakers, business leaders, educators, students, and subject matter experts to discuss the challenges our community faces and potential solutions to empower the Black community in our ongoing efforts to achieve full economic, educational, and social inclusion in the United States. We are fortunate to have Fidelity, Amgen, Prudential, and Walgreens as our 2021 forum sponsors. I appreciate their support and generous contributions to this year's forum. As chairwoman of the 57 members of the Congressional Black Caucus, we commemorate our 50th anniversary. And I am pleased to host this panel of very distinguished leaders who will identify the impediments, the disadvantages, and we will talk about the growth and general wealth, generational wealth development of Black-owned businesses, entrepreneurs, as well as opportunities that exist to advance these issues. Now, again, the title for today's forum is Money, Wealth, and Disparities, Build Black Better, Narrowing the Wealth Gap. Today, we will discuss opportunities for building and sustaining financial infrastructure for wealth creation in the Black community, including home ownership, access to capital for entrepreneurs and business diversity. We will also discuss ways in which our communities can leverage our priorities outlined in the Biden-Harris administration to build back better. As we look across the current landscape, it is increasingly apparent that current efforts to address the pervasive wealth gaps that plague Black communities are not yielding adequate, tangible, and timely results. Together with the brilliant minds joining us today, along with leaders across the country and members of the Congressional Black Caucus that are committed to this work in partnership with Build Back Better, I am hopeful that we will develop strategies to narrow the gaps and have historically excluded Black people and our communities from economic opportunities and access. Now, I know that's a lot, and we're going to put a lot into this session. So I'm going to push and drive a little bit, but I'm going to give you the full freedom to express yourself. So let's get started. We have a lot to cover. I'm going to introduce each of you, and then I'm going to ask each of you to give a 90-second opening remark. Let's start with Jason Wright. Jason is president of the Washington football team, the
the first black team president in the history of the NFL and was an NFL running back and played for teams, Jason, such as the Atlantic Falcons. I saw you there. My hometown, Cleveland Browns, the Arizona Cardinals. And he also has a bachelor's degree from Northwestern, an MBA from the University of Chicago, Booth. He also previously worked as a consultant at McKinsey and Company before assuming this current role. Thank you, Jason, for all that you do. Alicia Garza is the founder of Black Future Lab. The Black Futures Lab was created to build Black political power and transform Black communities. Under her leadership, the Black Futures Lab conducts the Black Census Project, the largest survey of Black people conducted in the United States since Reconstruction. Alicia is also co-founder of Black Lives Matter movement and hashtag, which helped to bring international attention to the issue of police brutality. Alicia has been featured in publications such as Times, Forbes, Essence, and I've certainly had the opportunity to stand with her and hear her speak truth to power. Thank you so much for being with us today. Hill Harper, our next guest. We know him from his humanitarian work. Maybe if you're like me, you have seen him on TV, whether it was The Good Doctor or whether it was many of his other shows like CSI, New York. But let me just say, we are very pleased with the work that he has done as founder and chairman of the Black Wall Street Digital Wallet. He is on the board of directors, the National Black Bank Fund, named honorary chair, co-chair of the redevelopment of Black Wall Street, Greenwood Chamber of Commerce, and served on the President's Cancer Panel having been appointed by President Barack Obama in 2011. Thank you for all of your work on the camera, in film, but more importantly, what you're doing across this nation. We were very proud to stand with you in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Thank you so much. And next we have David Clooney. David Clooney is the Executive Director of the Black Economic Alliance, BEA. Before starting BE at BEA, he served as Managing Director, Corporate Responsibility Department of J.P. Morgan Chase. Prior to his time at J.P. Morgan Chase, he was appointed by President Barack Obama as the Executive Secretary of the United States Department of Treasury. David is a proud Howard University Law School graduate. David, thank you for joining us and thank you for all of the work that you're doing now and that you did at the United States Treasury. To our audience, what a virtual panel we have today. These panelists are going to be amazing. And I wanna thank each of you in advance for your views on the important topics that we're going to discuss. So let me start by saying, I'm going to ask each of you to take 90 seconds and tell us something about yourself. And then I will ask you the first question. Jason, why don't we start with you? Certainly. Um, and Chair Beatty, Congresswoman, it's such an honor to be here with you. And thank you for having me on with the, some really dope people on this panel. It's a bit intimidating. Uh, but uh, my name is Jason Wright, president of the Washington football team. Um, uh, I think relevant to what we're talking about today, I was raised by um, two folks who come from a lineage of civil rights activists uh, on my dad's side and my mom's side. And their focus over time was always about economic opportunity for people of color, specifically black folks. And so that was always in my head as I thought about my career. When I was an NFL player, it was about how I could use that platform to generate opportunities for myself and others. So where my parents' economic ceiling would be my floor and so on and so on and so on and so forth to generate uh, generational wealth. So as I went to McKinsey and Company and was a partner there, I helped co-found the McKinsey Institute for Black Economic Empowerment, which did race, re research on the racial wealth gap, which is where we first met. 
at the Black Economic Forum, um, talking about topics of racial equity and the equitable distribution of capital, which was at the core of what we found in our research is that all different types of capital, financial, intellectual, relational, does not flow to Black folks at the same rate that it flows to other people in our society. And if we can do something about uh, moving the barriers to that flow of capital, we can actually see this wealth gap close. And so it's in the middle of doing that research where this opportunity became the, to become the president of the Washington football team came along. And I took it because it, it got me a chance to move from the observer's chair to the driver's seat and seeing the distribution of capital happen, especially as we look at a, a multi-billion dollar project that is gonna be an economic engine for the region. And if we infuse that with equity principles, we can do something really substantial and uh, not just talk the talk, but walk the walk in the process. And so uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm glad to be in this role and eager to offer some perspectives alongside everybody else. Thank you. And next we'll go to you, Alicia Garza. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my work every single day is not just to support you, Congresswoman Beatty, although I do enjoy doing that, but it is to make, it's doing the work to make Black communities powerful in politics so that we can be powerful in the rest of our lives. And that's really why we started the Black Futures Lab and the Black to the Future Action Fund because we recognize that so many of the disparities that our communities are facing are a result of rigged rules that keep our people from the things that we need to live well and that keep our people from the decision-making power that we need to change those rules and make new rules in the first place. And part of the challenge that I think we face here in terms of addressing rigged rules, especially as it relates to black communities is twofold. One is a story that we tell ourselves about who is responsible for those rules in the first place. And when it comes to the economy and the rules of the economy, so often, right, the stories that we're telling in the mainstream are that Black people aren't working hard enough to make the economy work for us. When in fact, the actual story, right, is that there are entities and individuals that are working really hard to keep black people from being able to benefit from the economy as it stands. And so once we're able to address that story, right, we're able to create a different set of policies and a different set of rules that doesn't place the blame on individuals for not being able to succeed in a system that was rigged against us in the first place. But instead, it also allows us to put the communities that are being left out and being left behind in a position to redesign what this economy can look like, what it looks like to have economic justice in our communities, what it looks like to be able to not just survive, but thrive in our communities. And so for us at the Black to the Future Action Fund and the Black Futures Lab, we work hard every single day to empower our communities to be able to know how to write those rules, know how to win those rules, and know how to implement those rules in cities and states across the country. But we also empower our communities and activate our communities to ensure that we are the ones, right, who are um, making the decisions about the rules that are impacting our lives every single day. So thank you so much for having me here and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. We'll go to you, Hill Harper. Congresswoman, thank you so much. It's, it's a pleasure to join all of you. Uh, you know, in 2011, I wrote a book called The Wealth Cure and it was all about how do we cure the racial wealth gap. And that book was a New York Times bestseller, but the problem was at the time is that technology was not where it needed to be to actually scale the type of impact we needed to have and we need to have. Um, the good news is the decade later, technology is now here where we have the ability to use decentralized technology, blockchain technology, and, and, and other platforms to actually work outside of, of traditional uh, systems and, and asset and wealth creation systems that have systemically and institutionally held us back. I think that you know, uh, uh, folks have spoken to it already. The most devastating data point that, that I often refer to that sort of motivates this work, for me at least, is that in 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, Black people in America held a little less than 1% of American wealth. Today, 
2021, 158 years later, Black people in America hold a little less than 1% of American wealth. And you could say, well, how, how could that be, Hill? Uh, you know, uh, after 400 years of, of, of inability to hold property, chattel slavery, et cetera, how could it be that uh, since then we've been able to so-called hold property, uh, earn uh, wage, earn living, and yet, yet we are exactly in the same place? And so uh, the work that I've done with uh, the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce, as well as, as, as in, in Tulsa and founding the Black Wall Street digital wallet and, and platform is all about recirculation of the black dollar. We can get into that more. Um, but if we're not actually recirculating the dollar in our community, we have $1.2 trillion of spending power, yet if we don't use it intentionally, we will continue to see the same results we're seeing uh, that have been uh, systemic boots on our neck, so to speak. And you truly can't have social justice without economic justice. So I'm happy to join this panel. Thank you so much. And now we'll go to you, David Clooney. Thank you, Congresswoman Beatty. Such a pleasure to be back with you and congratulations to the entire Congressional Black Caucus on celebrating 50 years um, and all the work you all have done in that time. Um, I have the privilege of leading the Black Economic Alliance. It is a relatively new, uh, only about three years old coalition of Black business leaders. And it is a new class of business leadership, Black business leadership who are essentially saying that they wanna no longer be the exception but become more of the rule of Black people who have established economic and political power for themselves um, and essentially are using their platform collectively to acknowledge the, the group came together out of an acknowledgement that um, there was not enough of this happening at a systemic level that um, essentially the investments that they were making in philanthropy and in business and, and in politics, um, they were unhappy with the lack of return on investment systemically. And, and that's to say they needed to come together to establish political power um, through our political action committee, but also um, a platform to speak uh, truth to power in the public, private, and nonprofit sectors about the inextricable link between the success of the Black economy and the U.S. economy. And we've seen a lot of statistics, um, like a city report uh, from the uh, financial institution Citigroup last year that showed the U.S. economy has missed out on $16 trillion of growth over the last 20 years as a result of racial inequality, and that we could add $5 trillion to our GDP um, if we were to close that gap. So our entire mission is about closing the Black-White wealth gap, driving um, economic mobility for Black folks at scale, and that requires absolutely an all-hands-on-deck approach. And um, I have had the, the pleasure of working throughout my career in the public sector and the private sector on economic policy, seeing where a lot of the roadblocks have been. But I think we're finally starting to begin, and, and particularly in the last year and a half, to have a national conversation about the role that the, that the government at the federal, state, and local levels has played uh, in essentially creating and, um, and widening and driving an even deeper um, wealth and opportunity gap between Black folks and, and the rest of Americans, starting with slavery and moving through essentially state-sponsored racism in different forms. Uh, and, and I appreciate that we're starting to talk about what that looks like today and what we have to do to proactively dismantle a lot of those systems. So I think this is a great conversation at a great time. Um, great to have the different perspectives represented. I am, I'm honored to be part of this August pan uh, panel of uh, really impressive voices from different perspectives. So look forward to getting into the conversation and, and hopefully moving the needle. Well, thank you. So let's get started. You gave me a great segue into the first question. Um, you talked about how do we walk the talk? You know, we do a lot of talking, but how are we doing that? You also talked about the decision making uh, process and the communities that are left behind. And we know that's black communities. Research tells us that. We also know you just talked about uh, black economic versus United States economic. And Mr. Harper, uh, the USA Today said about your book that it urges us not to only look at how we use our money, but how we define wealth. And I thought that was a very compelling statement after reading the book. So let's go to the first question in light of what you all have said in your opening remarks. What do you believe are the biggest impediments to closing or narrowing the racial wealth gap? And if you want to take a stab of telling us what you think racial wealth gap means, do so. And we're going to start with you, Ms. Garza. 
Well, I see I get all the good questions first. So for me, my understanding of the racial wealth gap is that there are racial disparities, right, in terms of assets and wealth between communities um, that have been defined in a certain way. Um, that is true, certainly uh, racially, uh, but we also have a gender wealth gap, right? Um, there are lots of ways in which communities that have been uh, marginalized from the political process, right? We see the impacts of that uh, in terms of things like wealth, uh, asset building, home ownership, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think for us, one of the big reasons that we see this happening uh, is that, uh, you know, we end up codifying racism in policy that organizes and regulates and oversees the economy. But we don't do the same in trying to figure out how we undo those rules. So if we're being honest, one of the things that uh, the Black to the Future Action Fund advocates for most often is race forward policies rather than race neutral ones. Um, what we understand, right, is that through a whole wealth of, no pun intended, a whole wealth of rigged rules like redlining, right, um, that black communities specifically have been targeted um, and had our wealth and our resources targeted. And so to undo that, we have to advance policies that are targeting specifically black communities for advancement. And in this country, we have a very, very difficult time doing that. We see a lot of backlash that happens. And part of that is because there is a cultural narrative in this country that black people are always trying to get something that we didn't work for. Well, we know that couldn't be farther than the truth, especially when we look at how the wealth of this nation was built and generated in the first place. But it's a very uh, um, uh, salient story uh, that helps to shape what rules are made and under what circumstances. Um, and so that's one of the things I think is important for us to think about in terms of the why the racial wealth gap persists. Uh, it, it is a, a function and a result of, of rules that have uh, been specifically designed to keep wealth away from some communities in favor of other communities when it comes to uh, Black communities in particular. Uh, but then the process of changing those rules, right, um, is, also, is, is also marred by racism because we refuse to acknowledge right, the engine that is driving these kinds of disparities. And so then when we are trying to craft solutions, we're trying to say, well, these are solutions for everybody, as opposed to diving into who has been uh, uh, deeply impacted and what specifically needs to be done in order to address those things. Thank you so much, Mr. Harper. Uh, yes, I, you know, Ms. Darvis is absolutely right. And, and I'll point folks, we have to be very clear about something. The racial wealth gap is, is worsening substantially. It's not, uh, it's not improving. It's not a zero sum. I, I would suggest uh, to anybody who hasn't actually read it, please look up the Road to Zero Wealth Prosperity Now Found a Study. So the road zero wealth is very in depth and you should read it. and it talks about the fact that black the, the black community will be at zero or negative wealth by 2053 mckinsey just three weeks ago came behind that study and said that the pandemic has moved that up 10 years and with latinos about 20 years behind us and so so this is something that we have to take on now and, and i have a little bit of a, a a different take uh from many of the folks that may be watching this um because i i truly am not confident that the government's going to be able to solve this problem we have to look uh, at ourselves and, and we have to look at the tools that we can use um, uh, to dismantle much of the systemic issues. Now, what, what is that hill? How do we break that down? Let me break that down really quick. One of the biggest problems uh, is that 90 to 95% of the, the asset value that we as black folks hold, we hold in the US dollar in cash. And the problem with that is that every time a black person goes to sleep at night, when they wake up the next morning, they're poorer because the declining purchasing power of the US dollar over the last 100 years has gone like this. We printed 22% of the circulating supply last year, it's just gonna get worse. And so if you're working for an hourly wage that hasn't kept up with inflation, you're actually, we all know folks who are working three jobs but can barely make ends meet. They can't understand why. Mainly 
because they're in cash and, and, and the US dollars actually become a liability. And so what are we gonna do? How are we going to uh, uh, change that? We have to get our community out of the matchless money mentality. We have to get them out of cash into ascending value asset classes because on the flip side, the wealthiest folks in our, you know, around the world and certainly in the US, um, 90 to 95% of their assets are not in cash. They're in ascending value asset classes such as blue chip stocks, high value real estate, mutual funds, uh, uh, fine art, Bitcoin, et cetera. And so when we talk about this, we have to look historically at the systemic and institutionally racist barriers that have been erected for us actually accessing them. Ms. Garza just pointing out whether we're talking about redlining and we can go down the line. How do we use the tools of technology today to actually move our people out and, and we can look at each other to be our, our, our own reparations, so to speak, because the beautiful thing that and Ms. Garza just pointed out, we work hard. Uh, we have $1.2 trillion of spending power. Yet a dollar leaves the black community within six to seven hours from when it gets in. And so if we don't solve that problem, uh, it will be a continuous cycle uh, that gets worse and worse and worse. And, and I believe that we can. I believe that we have the tools to do it. And uh, I believe that with collective action and working together cooperatively, and I can get into that more later, uh, uh, we will be able to do it. And, and, and so I'm, I'm very hopeful about this, um, but it's going to take a different type of work than we've been doing for, for a number of years. Thank you. Mr. Clooney. I, I would associate myself with the comments of uh, Alicia and, and Hill, and um, I'll just add, you know, I think some of the some of the impediments to breaking down the wealth gap have been not prescribing and recognizing the problem properly. And I think it is the need to build a new financial infrastructure that builds wealth and is not simply about maintaining or living at our means. I think we need to learn about wealth building opportunities. And um, for example, uh, just this morning, I'm sorry, not this morning, um, a few recently um, in Barron's uh, Black Economic Alliance uh, had a, um, uh, an op-ed that was co-signed by Ursula Burns, former CEO of Xerox, uh, Robert Smith, CEO of Vista Equity Partners, and John Rogers, CEO, co-CEO of Ariel Investments, and myself, talking about the opportunity that the government has to build wealth among Black people by revolutionizing the way that it contracts with Black businesses. And that is looking at one of the many recommendations we made was looking at high growth sectors and high growth businesses and companies like asset managers, lawyers, accountants, so on, moving on from just, you know, uh, I will be very real, I think part of the problem is um, Black folks are not trusted uh, with a lot of um, contracts and a lot of other businesses. And uh, we've been kind of relegated to certain categories of business like construction, cleaning services, et cetera. And those are all very important. We need to expand opportunities for those businesses, but also expand opportunities for different types of businesses, including high growth sectors. Um, and I think we need to look at opportunities like that. And, and I know Jason is doing a ton of work on, in this space with the NFL and with the Washington football team and otherwise on how we can break into whole new categories of opportunities to build wealth at scale um, and also tap into the opportunity. You know, We've been doing a lot of work at the Black Economic Alliance at investing in Black entrepreneurship with a view toward tapping into the um, multiplier effect of what it means for a Black business to do well, and then hire more Black workers, invest in other Black businesses, invest in their own community. So uh, there are so many more opportunities for us to do that. And we can also learn from the mistakes of the past, particularly the New Deal um, after recovering from the Great Depression and also um, you know, recovering from the Great Recession. And, and I was at Treasury for a lot of this time, and I can uh, acknowledge a lot of the missteps and missed opportunities we had to be very race forward, as Alicia talked about, in crafting programs that are not only meant to offset, but counteract and counterbalance the uh, impact of, um, uh, of really racist policies in the past that not only left out Black folks, but uh, intentionally excluded us. Thank you. And we'll close out. We will close out with you, Jason, and then we'll go to our next question so we can move into our second combination question that we're only gonna give you one minute to answer. Jason. Okay, great. And I'll be brief on this one too, because uh, much has been said. If I were to be very incisive about the business lever, since I'm not a policy guy and I don't, and I don't understand that world well enough to speak on it. Uh, there, if we had equal participation Based on, socioeconomic, based on our socioeconomic status in the financial system uh, as compared to our white peers, 
we would be in substantially better shape. And he'll, and he'll touch on this. So if you are an entry level worker, 22 years old, right out of college or came through a vocational route out of high school, black folks are not in a standard checking account or savings account earning the same interest as their white peer at that level. And then you go all the way up the spectrum to wealthy black folks, not being invited into special purpose vehicles, elite funds that get, generate super high returns. We need parity at each level in participation in the financial system. And that will go a long ways to getting us there. And that's about access. That's about relational capital and several different things. The thing that's more relevant to my world that David alluded to is we need to increase the ubiquity of black businesses in so far that we can maintain a dollar within black economic circles for a longer period of time before it translates out or keep more of that dollar over a longer period of time, creating self-sustaining economic systems. And we need more sustainable black businesses that are more than sole prop and last more than four years, three to four years at a time. And we also need black businesses to scale, to become national and global players. We need to 100X, in my opinion, the number of $1 billion plus revenue black businesses over the next couple of decades in order to achieve that. Right. And, uh, and so those are the things that, you know, when I think about the capital we have, as we think about, you know, what's traditionally called supplier diversity, I would call deep partnership and business building alongside black businesses. That's something I can do when we're doling out capital the way we are in a new venue project. And I think every business can do. So uh, those are the two things, participation in the financial system, that parity and the ubiquity of black businesses so that we can create self-sustaining uh, black economic ecosystems. Thank you so very much. All of you are successful in some field of business, but let me just take this moment of personal privilege to say thank you for what you just said. As you know, I serve as the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee on the Powerful Financial Services Committee. And your opt-ed that you co-authored with those you mentioned, right on point and on spot. We have said to everyone coming before our committee, all the big banks with $50 billion and more in assets, then we need you to change the language from talking about minority procurement. Those contracts are great for 50 and $500,000, but there are 50 billion and $500 billion contracts out there. So we have actually written into our legislation, business diversity. And to talk about asset management, We'll give someone a position, 10 people a position and play the number game. How many, you talked about gender uh, disparities and you're so right. So they'll hire 10 women, one brown person and two black men and they'll check the box. But then when we find out those positions don't report to the CEO or five levels down, they've never been in the boardroom. And while those jobs are great, it's not good enough. So thank you for telling us race forward. We need parity forward and we need to move our agenda forward. With that, the next question, and I'm going to start with you, uh, Mr. Harper, and then we'll go to Jason, Garza, and Clooney. What one thing would you say to a young person, and everything's relative, a young person starting their business. When people see panels like you, they write in and they say, they talked to their peers. You know, they're already successful. Ask them, what one thing would they say to me in being a young entrepreneur? One thing. And then the second part of that question talks to the social injustices. We have seen corporate America try to step up because of the George Floyd incident, pledging billions and billions of dollars into communities, pledging billions and billions of dollars. Operative word, pledging. We need to hold them accountable to get beyond the pledge. What would you say to the young person? What would you say to corporate America? Okay, so, so I'll be as, as, as quick as I can. You know, the, 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 the reason why most black businesses and startups fail in the, in the first two years is they're undercapitalized to begin with. 
and there's a high degree of inefficiency uh, in the actual business practice and the tools that are available. And there, and, and also there's no safety net. Oftentimes there's, there's mommy, daddy, uh, friends network is not there to actually help or grab or provide a safety net. Um, and so, so how do we start to fix th those problems? That, that's why I, I created the Black Wall Street digital wallet and app. And so, so that we can be our own safety net. We can actually institute peer-to-peer -peer lending. We can share best business practices. We can actually create money flows and capitalize businesses um, through five to $50,000 loans, et cetera. And so, so that's number one. Make sure that you button up those things. Be as efficient as possible. Learn best business practices in that space, as well as figure out access to capital. Now, that's harder said than done. And then, and then when, you, when you flip to corporate America and you look to accountability, we want to actually rate these companies. So we want to really do the work and due diligence to say, hey, this is what you promised. And this is and, and so on the Black Wall Street uh, platform, we, we are actually coming with a Black Wall Street rating for these actual entities that have made promises, most of whom at press press conferences and 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 putting out press releases yet have not followed through. And if they do, they're actually following through with the same systemic and institutionally racist um, notions baked into the way they want to dole out the money. Um, and so we have to look at that. We also have to really focus on our MDIs. We have to remember that we, our MDIs are ex is essential. Only 1% of the business loan flow that comes out of majority banks goes to uh, black business, where 67% of those loans come out of MDIs. So we have to make sure that we undergird our MDIs and, um, and, and make sure that we're actually playing in, 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 in the highest tech space within that uh, financial flow in that MDI space. Okay, that was great. Hope everybody took notes on that. Ms. Garza, we'll go to you and then we'll proceed quickly. Okay, I'll be fast. So uh, the, the word to give to young people, right, is to um, help us reimagine a new way of producing, consuming, and distributing. Um, and, and that's really about new forms of relationships. And one thing I know about uh, this generation is that folk are already in the process of um, figuring out uh, new ways of being that strengthen the relationships amongst us, that respect ourselves and one another, um, and that challenge, right, some of the old ways of doing things. Um, and so I'm really uh, excited about um, what we will come up with together. I think uh, uh, the conversation about what to say um, with corporate entities uh, is, is a little bit complicated um, for a few reasons. So uh, the first thing that I would say is, you know, in this conversation, we always have to remember that um, not everybody is an entrepreneur. Not everybody is a homeowner. Not everybody can actually get close to that. And that is not because of, um, any individual failing, right? A lot of that has to do with uh, not just systemic inequities, but it has to do with the way that our economy is structured. And there are so many people right now um, who are not owners, but who are workers, um, who are being deeply underpaid, who do not have the safety net that they need to ever approach the dream of home ownership, ever approach the dream um, of being able to work for yourself. Uh, and that's a problem. Um, it's a problem because it, it creates an enormous strain uh, on our resources, uh, but it also uh, perpetuates, right, this, this notion that um, some people are throwawayable, um, some people are disposable and other people are worth saving. Uh, and so I think one of the things we really have to get uh, serious about uh, is ensuring that there is equity in these institutions that by and large do tend to want to operate independently. And I think as a nation, we do have to make a decision about um, whether or not that will be the case. It has been an ongoing struggle for the last several decades, uh, whether or not, right, corporate entities uh, must be accountable to the same rules that everybody else has to be accountable to. Uh, and, th and that is also unfortunately true when it comes to uh, uh, corporate entities that are led by, run by, or owned by Black people. Uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, my grandmother used to say, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And we do have to address these kinds of contradictions. Absolutely, uh, uh, Black-owned entities, right, 
uh, should have a different lens on what it means for our communities to advance, but there is not necessarily an incentive to do that. Um, and so we do need to just be mindful of that. We need to have the real discussions that we need to about that. And we also have to make some pretty important uh, uh, decisions around our orientation to policy, our orientation to government, and our orientation to governance. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Jason, and then Mr. Clooney. I'll be really quick um, and I'll take a different angle. I think for folks starting a business or entering the workforce, the thing that I would uh, say to young folks is you can let go of the idea that you're walking into a meritocracy. It is, it is not fair. And putting your head down and coming up with the most brilliant business plan or the most innovative new gadget or whatever it is, is not gonna be enough. Uh, and, and that's not just uh, for us as black folks, that's across the spectrum for people that have been historically disinvested in. It's actually relationships, connections, and your network that open up these opportunities. And to leverage the opportunities you have amongst, whether it's other black professionals, state and local leaders in your area, the leaders of banks in your area, to create personal relationships that are going to open doors for you over time. Now, we're talking here about how we take down the systemic things, but I think young folks need to know that the daily grind is about following up on those business cards you get, cultivating personal relationships over meaningful moments where people are going to favor you over somebody else in a situation when a decision needs to be made, and that cultivating those relationships is as important as building out the brilliant business idea that you're working on. And there's a whole lot more we can talk on there, but you need to know that that is part of the game and that's gonna get you that extra oomph that's needed to get your business to scale. Okay, Mr. Cloney. So I will agree with all of those points and, and I will say uh, to, to be different, um, my advice to business black business owners would be to diversify your capital stack. That sounds way more complicated than it is. That essentially means do more due diligence and go to a more a wider network of resources to find um, capital at a better rate. Um, and a lot of it is because of what Jason talked about where it is not fair. There's absolutely institutional bias against giving you capital at the same cost of capital or one at the same level uh, that of money that you've asked for, but also at the same cost of capital, typically the interest rate um, that your white counterparts are, are seeking that, um, that capital for. And a lot of them have um, a safety network that you don't. So it's essentially um, using your network, building a network of friends, information, um, and, and resources to find different types of capital at a fairer price for you and also help you get the amount of money you need to actually build and scale your business um, and not be as limited as a lot of Black businesses have been uh, in starting their businesses and, and often are, are hamstrung in trying to grow. And, and it's actually a decent segue, or uh, the way I'll segue to answer the question about how to keep corporate America responsible to follow through on their commitments. Um, one of the ways the Black Economic Alliance is doing that, trying to address both of those uh, issues is through, um, we have a BEA Entrepreneurs Fund that uh, is a $50 million fund to invest in Black entrepreneurs. And with a focus on the other piece of advice to Black entrepreneurs is not giving away too much of your business. Um, a lot of Black businesses, unfortunately, are um, diluted by giving away too much of their equity um, when they feel like they have to in order to uh, receive particularly venture capital funding. So um, we have partnered with a number of different corporate partners uh, and, and received a $20 million anchor investment from Wells Fargo toward our $50 million fund, um, which is just the beginning because there's so much more work to do in this space. But I think what companies have to do is instead of getting caught up in the arms race of trying to have the biggest number for their financial commitment toward racial equity, it's looking at all the different ways they interact with institutional racism. And that is across the spectrum of everything from HR to business diversity to how, what opportunity they have to impact wealth building, even if they're just talking about with their own employees. Uh, and I think one of the pieces of advice I would give the business community is being open and honest about this and creating more of an environment of disclosure where if we see that this is a problem that is not only shared by two or three organizations, but is essentially shared by every organization across industries, we will have a better ability to diagnose the full scale of the problem and begin to address it. So um, those are two answers to a much, much longer question that we don't have time to get into uh, in full detail. Well, well and, thank you. And Congresswoman, Congresswoman, I wanna jump in real quick and, and, and really, and really come back on a point that, that David just made is very important. You'll, you'll also find that 
when you're dealing with attempting to raise money, because I found this just in my experience with with the, the Black Wall Street and, and, and the, the app and the digital wallet, that, that, that money will try to actually change your business as well. And so not only is the capital more expensive, they may they, they, they look at you saying, oh, you're servicing the black community. So how are we going to make money off the people? Meaning oftentimes with other companies, they'll say, hey, build the ecosystem, give away the value, allow the, allow the ecosystem to grow by giving the value away. And then there'll be a switch for profitability. Oftentimes they look at our community and they actually want to uh, 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 have a predi- more predatory view that we need to be making money day one out of our community don't necessarily give the value away. So be very careful as you're actually even taking money as to how they're pushing you if they're actually changing your business to actually not give value to the people you're attempting to serve. And I think that's a very important point. I think I think that was an excellent point and I'm glad you were able to get that in. You've given us a lot of information for those listening to digest. Let me just say, we heard, let's hold them accountable. I'm calling it a report card. Thank you for that, Heal, in telling us. We're going to hold them accountable. We also heard heard a lot of language, MDI, Minority Depository Institutions. We're working very hard in financial services to make sure that they are included in this. We also heard a lot of things that this is not going to be easy, that there are still some, some, there are still issues of disparity and racism and social injustices. So when we think of where we are in this country now, COVID-19, the disparities that hit us with the social injustices, with the economics and healthcare. We've heard about redlining from many of you. We've heard about the lack of access to capital, systemic racism. So when you think of all of those issues, we're going to make this near our end of our rapid answers with each of you, because I want to allow you uh, to have a minute or so uh, where you can do your closing remarks, where you can look into your cameras and talk to the hundreds of thousands of people who are listening to this during our Congressional Black Caucus Forum and tell us what you would like them to know. But if you could prioritize one policy, legislative, wish that you could have that would have an immediate impact on helping us narrow the wealth gap or helping us to build Black better? What would that one thing be? For example, would it be helping people with their student loan, canceling it? Would it be reparations? We heard that today. Would it be a down payment? for a first time home buyer? Would it be a protege program where businesses take in a young entrepreneur? What are some of the things that we can do? Or give me one thing, each person. I'm gonna let you pick your order. And if you don't, I'll call on you. Let's go. What one thing would you say? I'll go, I can I can go first since I'm the the least legislative savvy here. I'll I'll take the business angle, and I think that anything that could bring transparency on business practices, insofar as it relates to the equitable distribution of capital, could be really good. And that that starts with composition of top team in businesses, to composition of the workforce to the actual dollars received in the growth of businesses that are in the supplier and vendor partnership network, uh, all the way through to social and community impact. Where have the dollars gone? What types of organizations have they gone to in what census tracks and what's been the record, the track record of those over time? If you could have some kind of transparency there where you could put everybody apples to apples, you don't have to do much else because I think there's enough motivators in the market to drive better practices if you were able to just simply shine an accurate light. Okay, so we'll say transparency. Love that answer. Who's next? So Alicia, I'll ask you to go because I want to say something race forward and I don't want to take your ideas. So please go ahead. You're so great. They have to give me one one thing. The clock is timing us down. All right. Well, my one thing would be Uh, to remove policies that lock us out of good jobs and to advance policies that allow us to invest in the health 
and safety and wellness of our communities. There's a whole suite of things that we need to do in order to make sure that um, the market is not running us, but that we are running the market. And like that is something that is very market. important for the advancement of our communities, but also for the sustainability of it. Excellent. So okay. I will add, uh, I, my one wish would be uh, for a race specific policy to look at the history of access to capital for black Americans in particular, and essentially offset that with race specific policies that address our experience in home lending, business lending, um, and, and every other type of access to capital that essentially proactively counteracts the impacts and uh, legacy of systemic racism. Excellent. Okay, that leaves it to you, Hill Harper. It, 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 it relates to what everybody has said, but it's about startup capital to me for small businesses and startups, uh, black businesses. We have to create jobs. A study recently came out that talked about that 93% of the new hires of small black businesses and startups are black folk. But that also said the reverse is true. 93% of the new hires of white small businesses and white startups are white folk. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out if we're going to create black jobs, we got to create new black businesses and we got to support them. So getting capital directly to these businesses, um, lo locally, startups on the ground, particularly young people, particularly in the tech space and the creative and idea economy space. That's what we need to focus. And, and that's, you know, that's the work I'm doing. And I think that that's the help we need. Let me just say, I could not have asked for better answers. These are answers that we're going to take back to the Congressional Black Caucus. Members of the Congressional Black Caucus represent 17 million Black Americans and 78 million Americans. We have a strong voice. We have a big voice, and that's why it's so important for us to speak up, stand out, and listen to you. As we come to a close, I'll allow you one minute for your final closing remarks to the thousands, hundreds of thousands of individuals listening. We'll, we'll end like we began. We'll start with you, Jason. Build Black businesses wherever, however, and in any way you can. Ms. Garza. Work with us to advance the Build Back Boulder agenda, which looks at economic security. It looks like uh, uh, advancing racial justice, economic justice, gender justice. And it looks like promoting the kind of democracy that we all deserve. You can visit us at blacktothefuture.org. Mr. Harper. I created the Black Wall Street Digital Wallet and, and app for financial literacy purposes to then get us out of cash and get us into uh, ascending value asset classes. We're in a time right now, uh, in, in an amazing time where we're moving out of fiat or hard money currency into digital currency and cryptocurrency. And that, that train's not, not stopping. And if we could actually move our community quicker into that space, we can have them. So please download the Black Wall Street Digital Wallet on in the App Store, uh, Google Play, uh, Android, iOS, and, and start using it. Start watching the educational videos and start moving your money out of cash and into Bitcoin. Uh, I promise you, you're running to me a few years from now and you say, Hill, that's the best decision I ever made. Uh, let's go. I'm gonna hold you to that. You get the last word, Mr. Clooney. Thank you, Congresswoman. I would implore everyone inside, but particularly outside of the black community to tap into the feeling they had in the first two weeks of June, 2020 after George Floyd's murder when they were going out of their way to figure out how to look outside of their own experience and understand the Black experience and take that energy toward figuring out how you can counteract, proactively counteract systemic racism in, in your daily lives, but particularly in building a new financial infrastructure for Black folks that helps build generational wealth that we've never had before and helps the entire U.S. economy in the process. Thank you so much. You've just heard from David Clooney, Hill Harper, Jason Wright, and Alicia Garza. And I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty. And this was Money, Wealth, and Disparities, Build Black Better, Narrowing the Wealth Gap, Our Power, Our Message. I'm Congresswoman Joyce Beatty, and I approve this message. My goodness. If we had a starting five, you know, people talk about uh, the ideal uh, basketball team with the starting five, 
But we, how better can we get Jason Wright, Hill Harper, David Clooney, Alicia Garza, and at the center, uh, Congresswoman Joyce Beatty? What a remarkable panel. What, what uh, searing insight. What profound inspiration. And what nuts and bolts uh, for us to grasp hold of and to deploy in trying to make black wealth a reality. Generational wealth is critical. Fostering a financial uh, stability that allows us to love and support our families is amazingly necessary. And this panel today, again, this year reminded us of the systemic inequities and the obstacles and impediments that prevent the flourishing of black wealth, but the determination of black people to overcome and to keep moving forward and to generate that wealth so that our children and our children's children will be able to reap the benefit has been incredibly important. And let me say on a personal note, uh, I give an offer since this is the first meeting we've had since the death of uh, the great Otto Beatty, my love and dedication to his memory and his wife's uh, elegant and eloquent continuation of a legacy they have built together, a formidable fusion of two souls, hearts, and minds. And we celebrate Otto Beatty and the memory of his brilliance, of his commitment, of his devotion, and of his love. Most of all, not only love for his community, but love for his beautiful and brilliant bride, Joyce Beatty. We offer these words and dedication to his memory and to the continued project and agenda of the great Congresswoman from Ohio, Joyce Beatty. God bless you and look forward to next year.